Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. When her kids were young, she parented intuitively, which worked pretty well. Then they hit their teen years and life became chaotic, tense and drama-filled. This week's guest felt worried, angry, frustrated, scared and exhausted. She told her kids what they should do and what they need to do. She offered her wisdom and told them why they were wrong and what the right way was. And when none of that worked, she punished them. The result was more conflict, arguments, and they shut her out. Like most parents, she read books, listened to podcasts and speakers, but nothing seemed to work. In 2016, she found a program which showed completely new parenting communication strategies that dramatically changed her relationship with her children and made her house a more calm and peaceful place to be. These strategies and tools were so life-changing that she knew she needed to get this information into the hands of as many parents as possible. Janine is a professional life coach who specialises in helping parents navigate the challenges of raising teens. Her coaching services aim to provide parents with the necessary tools and techniques to create more harmonious relationships with their teens. Now, we all want that. Parents gain the skills needed to set boundaries, encourage responsibility and empower their teens to become the best versions of themselves. One of the key goals of Janine's coaching is to help parents reduce drama and conflict in their parenting journey. She believes in providing simple, easy to implement solutions to everyday challenges, allowing parents to feel more relaxed and confident in their teens' choices. Through her guidance, Parents can foster an environment of ease where meaningful conversations and connections can thrive. This is the Strong, Single and Human podcast. Hi, Janine Mushwa. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Claire Martin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, (laughs) it's great. I can't wait to talk to you about the subject we're going to talk to you um talk about today because i mean my son's not there yet but i feel as though he is right or he's going to be there very soon and we're talking about teenage children basically how we can deal with our tweens tweens teens yeah. moody emos i don't know <laughs> whatever you want to call them smelly need a shower two <laughs> three times a day children right who are awesome But are going through a lot of hormonal changes, right? Which makes them grumpy, grumpy, moody, having a bit of an issue, finding their feet and all of the various different other things that they do. Um, So so look, what, where, what, what are the key areas where parents go wrong with their teenage kids? Mm, Okay. Such a good question. Probably a big question answer as well isn't it (laughs) that's a big question um yes big answer you're right big answer you know what I found from my own experience what I find working with clients is that we tend to without even knowing it right we're coming from a a good place with loving intentions but it just when we're talking to our teens it comes out little sneaky words like you should do this, or you need to do this, right? Or this is the right way to do something. Or in my family, a super popular one was giving advice (laughs) or life lessons, right? We're offering our wisdom. 
And the intention behind it is almost always just to, you know, we want to help our kids. We love them and we want to make their life smoother and easier. And the fact is, is we have a lot more years of wisdom than they do. And so, of course, naturally, we just end up talking to them that way, um, you know, from a really place of a good heart and good intention. On top of that, you know, that's the way we communicated with them for the first decade or so. Well, this was what I was going to say, right? We're parents who are teaching them and showing them things and, you know, giving them experiences so that they know what it's all about. Exactly. And so when they're young, I think that the differences and what to recognize here, Claire, is that when they're young, they, the first 10, 12 years before they hit the teen years, they need something different from us than they need when they're teens. Right. So when you think about when they were little, right, they needed help to tie their shoes. They needed to understand don't run into the street. Right. They needed to know what the boundaries were if they're up high on the jungle gym so they don't fall down and crash and break their neck. And so a lot of our job was communicating to them in a way that involved like, you need to do this, you should do this, offering your wisdom, giving your advice, right? Just kind of, it was the way we dialogued with them. Basically, you know, when they're little, they were super curious mm. and we got to provide our wisdom. And what happened most of the time is that we get positive feedback, right? They listen. Yeah. Most of them listen when they're young. <laughs> Not all, but most or most of the time. Um, you know, when we share knowledge that we have, it's like their eyes light up because we're yeah. teaching them about the world. And they appreciate what we're doing, right? We get hugs, we get kisses, we get rewarded. And so just naturally as being a, a normal human being, when we get rewarded, when we get positive feedback, when we feel good, we're going to keep doing the same thing. We're going to reinforce that habit and keep doing it. And so when that happens for a decade or more, it just becomes your natural way of approaching your child. Yeah. The huge problem there is when they're teenagers they need something different from you. Right? They, yeah. they are now, they want to come up with their own wisdom. They don't want you to tell them your advice. Right? They well, want and to also, figure it out themselves. And also sitting there as an old mom like me, right? So I'm in my 50s, right? And so the, th the thing is, right, life has changed, right, from when I was a kid. So although I can impart my wisdom, to my son, and even now, and he's going to be eight in a few weeks, right? Even now, like, it's such a different world from when I was growing up. And so mm -hmm. he just looks at me and goes, oh, you so don't know, do you? You're not in with the in crowd. Like, you don't know about Roblox. And I have to go Roblox because yeah. I keep going, it's roadblocks. And he goes, no, there's no road in it. It's a row, mum. So, yeah. So things have changed, right? And being an older mum, I'm yeah. very conscious that my life is very different from his life, not my childhood mm -hmm. as such. So yeah, mm -hmm. wow, wow. Yeah. And just to recognize that, you know, no one teaches us how to parent when we go to school. No, I and wish so did. consequently, we're just left usually repeating what, however we were raised. And those same patterns, yeah. that that same approach. And like you mentioned, you know, we've got, we're living in a different culture and a different society with different kid, types of kids and different issues. And so that approach that our parents used is not always the most effective to be using with our children. And, and I agree, right? Being a 70s baby, we were still being smacked and all the various different other things. That, I mean, there was corporal punishment at school, right? I mean, you oh, don't yeah. have that, like, hello. So, yeah. Um, yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a different world now, and and that's a good thing, I think. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think it's a good thing too. And at the same time, to also be compassionate and patient with yourself, and realize, wait, this is really all I know. This is what I grew yeah. up with. And so, you know, to really seek out new resources, new information on new parenting approaches that can be more effective. And I I also think, Claire, there's more of a desire now as parents to connect with your child. Um, You know, that wasn't as common in the previous generation. It was more like, do as you're told, be quiet, Yeah. (laughs) go to your room, right? Like you know, we don't children want to should be you. seen and not you. heard. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Children should be seen and not heard. Right. And like mm-hmm. kids have an opinion and they're forming uh, their opinions and values and behaviors and all of that stuff. And if you don't allow them to do that in a safe space, then, you know, they're going out into the big wide world and they, they'll get burnt a few times mm-hmm. talking, maybe yeah. putting their opinion across when it's not the right time or just, not actually learning how to listen effectively. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so all of true. those things. So how do we how do we help our teenagers as such? Because there's a lot going on mm-hmm. in them as mm-hmm. you know, when there's hormonal changes, they're getting to, you know, recognize and look at recognize that's maybe the wrong word but like they're they're getting to like recognize my brain's not working this morning recognize the opposite sex and all of those emotions and feelings that go with you know but it may be the opposite sex it might be the same sex let's not even let's not paint everyone with the heterosexual brush as it were um but they're actually getting to getting to grips with their own sexuality and, and who they are and what they're doing um and then there's this whole bigger communicating, parents hassling them, having to do schoolwork, jobs, all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, like, how do we help them transition this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maya of issues, issues, well, experiences, Challenges. opportunities, <laughs> opportunities. <laughs> yes, I love it. Opportunities. Yeah, no, I, you know, you're absolutely right. They are going through a lot and they're trying to, you know, figure it out. And and like you said, if we can just put ourselves in their shoes for a moment, they're under a lot of pressure. Mm. Right? There's, there's academic pressure going on much more so than we grew up with. Sometimes it comes from the parents, sometimes it comes from the teachers, sometimes it comes from themselves yeah. or what, you know, or their peers, but there's academic pressure, there's social pressure, right? I mean, teens are so self-conscious and they're very concerned, most of them about fitting in and mm-hmm. having friends um, and not being awkward. Um, you know, they're also, a lot of other things are demanded of them, like you need to play a sport or you need to do community service. Our teens have naturally a lot of overwhelm and pressure going on. And I think just starting as a parent with remembering that, trying to remember when you were a teen and how that felt. And really, even more than that, put yourself in your own child's shoes at this moment and look at what they're going through um, and try to just you know, have a little compassion for the fact that they're probably feeling overwhelmed, pressure, humiliated, or embarrassed, or trying to fit in like a huge range of emotions they're going through, many that they've never experienced before. And they don't know how to always handle it to the best of their ability. Yeah. So I think just starting as a parent with a little bit of compassion and followed with some curiosity about what is going on for them. You can even say like, wow, being a teen is so hard. You know, what do you, what's the most challenging thing for you going on right now? You know, versus what we typically do is how was your day at school? Fine. What'd you do? Nothing. 
Well, like, this so is the more... thing, right? And and like I'm going, how how deep do you delve, right? As such, how like how, what questions are okay? Because there's mm-hmm. the attitude, there's the conflict, there's a like, I'm fine, I'm okay, I don't have any issues or whatever. That do you continue questioning? Do you step back, take a deep breath, and then think, right, I'll come back to the subject in half an hour? Um, I don't know. Yeah, it it is a dance to do, absolutely. And I think the more aware we are of what's going on with our teenager, the more we are like our intuition will guide us, you know, so, you know, you're asking yourself, okay, yes, I'm really curious what's going on at school right now. And I want to know, and all I'm getting back right now is it's fine and stop asking me and don't bother me. You know, you got to use your intuition, say like, okay, here's, me over here that has a desire for information. And at the same time, I need to check, check in and touch base with like, what does my team need from me right now? And if you feel like they're shutting down, then maybe what they need is just some time to unwind. Mm -hmm. And it might not be the best time to be drilling them about what's going on. And so one of the most critical things with teenagers is resisting that urge to like get the information that you want right now right or we all have this urge to like talk to them right in the moment like let's say for example um you know they're disrespectful to you like most of us get really triggered by that and oh, we yeah. just immediately emotionally react with you can't talk to me that way right <laughs> And what I would suggest is just with the teenagers, try to slow yourself down and resist that urge to to jump in and either demand they act a certain way or demand they tell you a certain thing. When when they feel like you're trying to make them do something or make them tell you, you're going to get resistance. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So shifting out of that trying to make them or force them to do something or say something. And just like taking a step back and a little breather and thinking, okay, what do they need from me right now? Right. And how, how can I maybe guide them? Or maybe this, you know, I need to revisit the situation later when they've had time to unwind. Yeah. But what about if you What about if they are starting to shut down and not open up, um, maybe through issues such as um, addiction abuse, uh, you know, or abuse or or bullying or whatever that's going on that they don't actually really feel. So they feel as though if they tell you, you'd be disappointed or all of these emotions that go with, you know, like shame and all of these things, right? Um, Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you connect? How do you get, how do you get in there to start a conversation? Because to my mind, once they start shutting down, um, mm-hmm. you as a parent, you don't want to back away. You want to care. You want to look after your child. Mm-hmm. But they're backing away. They're shutting down. They're, you know, starting to mm-hmm. have changes, mood changes or whatever. Like, how do you connect? How do you get in there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough, right? This Mm. isn't easy by any stretch of the imagination. But I think that what I have observed with myself and with my clients is that where we get stuck is when we focus on the behavior we're seeing on the surface, right? right? So whether that's they got a D on a test they hit their sibling, their smoking pot, um, whatever the behavior is that scares us, we naturally tend to focus on that and make the conversation around that. And that's when we start saying, hey, you know, you need to stop smoking or you should be nice to your sibling or why'd you get a D on the test? And what I would suggest is that That's just really looking at the surface level behavior. And the fact is, is that there's always a thought and a feeling 
underneath that, that causes the behavior, right? So, so let's say that you find out your teen was smoking in the bathroom, right? And you come in like all gangbusters, you know, like, oh, what are you doing? You know, you're breaking the rules and the smoking's bad for you, right? All the like natural responses. All the normal things that you would say. Would say, (laughs) right? So what I'm suggesting is you slow down and you think, okay, there was actually some sort of thought that went on in my kid's brain before they decided to go and smoke in the bathroom when they know Mm. they're not supposed to do that, right? And so you want to get curious about that. Like that's the root cause of the behavior that's worrying you. So you want to, you want to kind of, you want to try to get curious around that without um, sitting in judgment on them. Right. So like perhaps maybe they, they felt like, okay, well, I'm trying to fit in with this group and I felt pressure to join them and smoke. And I felt like if I didn't, I wouldn't fit in. Okay. That's a much different conversation. That's a conversation around, okay, so let's talk about what you can do differently when you're feeling pressure, you know, from your friends to fit in and and to smoke. Like, let's have a conversation around that, you know, because of course, anybody who wants to fit in with a group of friends, if they're feeling pressure, often you make a bad choice and a bad decision. Yeah. So I think that's really the key, Claire, is that we naturally tend to focus on behavior and punish for it <laughs> or yeah. try to make them stop the behavior. And what I'm suggesting is if you can approach them with a sense of curiosity, with a sense of compassion, and to really get at the root cause of the problem, what's going on? What are they thinking and feeling that's causing the behavior? You know, if if they got a D on the test, it's so natural for us to think, well, yeah, that's because every time I looked at you, you're scrolling on TikTok for hours. You didn't even study for your test. Yeah. Right. That kind of approach and conversation leads to an explosion. (laughs) <laughs> and a battle and fighting and them shutting Versus down basically them shutting down them they get defensive they put their walls up versus like okay let's figure out what's going on here like you know asking them so hey tell me like i'm sure that didn't feel good to you to get a d like what's going on there you know and 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 try to explore and see, well, maybe they didn't understand a concept and maybe they were too embarrassed to ask a question about it in class. Or maybe they tried and tried and tried to do this math problem they couldn't figure out and they got frustrated and gave up. Yeah. It's like, let's back it up and find out like what happened before the behavior that you're seeing that you're worried about. And I, I, my son is eight, like I said, but like I find. If I explode and go, oh my God, why did you do that? What are you doing? Like it, even he like shrinks away and goes, oh, okay. Um, I need to hide this or I need to lie or I need to do X, Y, and Z. So is it mm-hmm. is it better to because because how do you educate your teen on the right thing to do? Mm-hmm. Or are you supposed to leave them to make their mistakes now, right? At the end of the day, mm-hmm. you're supposed to have laid the foundation for them in their formative years. And now they're getting mm-hmm. into a place where it's now time for them to start taking responsibility for their actions, for their behaviors, um, and the consequences of their actions and behaviors. And therefore, if we as parents are there for them all the time and pick mm-hmm. up the pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, i.e., I don't know, they get caught bullying somebody at school for want of a better example. That's really bad, but for want of a, and you get called up to the school and then, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and they're told, you know, if they get caught again, um, they'll be suspended for two weeks or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. and then like how, oh, and this is probably a bad example, but like, how do you then, like you could explode and go, oh my God, mm-hmm. like, you know, that's really bad. I've not brought up a child who bully people and blah, 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 and all that. Or 
is it that you really need to take a deep breath, stand back Mm -hmm. and then understand why? Like, Mm -hmm. is it really around going, okay, so look, this happened. Mm -hmm. Not sure I'm comfortable with it, but let's try and understand, like, what is it you need from me? What's going on with you, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is that really where we're going Mm -hmm. from? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a great question to ask, like, you know, the more the perspective of what is it that you need from me, you know, or how can I help you? You know, it's starting with the assumption, like in your example, that, you know, the odds are your teen doesn't want to be a bully, but something's going on at, you know, inside of him that's causing him to behave that way. And so when we just like the school, like you're saying, is it suspends them or punishes yeah. them, we're not getting to the root cause of the problem. Yeah. And the punishing is just like a short term external motivation fix. And as, as soon as the punishment is over, the teen typically repeats the behavior. So yeah. what we want to do is find out, you know, is is really try to connect with them versus punishing them or attacking them and to find out like what's going on inside of you that caused that. I'm sure you didn't intend to hurt somebody. You you know, you're, you're a kind, good person. So what's going on that caused that behavior? And I think to your point, you know, that teens will lie, not tell you the truth, right? Because they have this thought error. <laughs> they think that telling you the truth is going to give, it's going to have a worse outcome wow. than lying, right? So they okay. think if they tell you the truth, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be angry. You might even punish them. And like you mentioned before, Claire, like, when a child feels their parents' disappointment in them, they feel shame. Yeah. And that feels awful. Yeah. You know, when their parents are angry at them, that feels awful. And obviously, no kid wants to get punished. So if they think, if I tell my mom the truth that I ditched school or that I, previous example, smoked in the bathroom or, you know, whatever, got a D on the test. She's going to be so mad. So instead, I'm not going to tell her and I'm going to lie about it. And because they think this is the thought error that you will, you, that way they're avoiding disappointment, anger, and punishment. But so as we the, know, well, usually the truth comes out. I know. Right? When, but this is the thing, right? So is our, as parents, right, is the expectation that these teens, God love them, these alien people that we've brought brought up that are now growing, developing their own minds, their thoughts, and is the expectation that they will lie, no matter how much of a good kid they are, right, there will be white lies, black lies, gray lies, purple lies, whatever. But these teens will actually at some point lie to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's not uncommon. I lied to my parents. I mean, I think most kids. Yeah. It's a very long time ago. I was a teenager, but like, yeah, yeah. There's there's probably times where I've gone or I've just not told them anything. Yeah. Yeah. So part of it is to recognize like some of this is normal behavior. And so to kind of recognize that so we don't get so emotionally reactive to it. So we don't get so angry, you know, and mad and pissed off and start thinking like, you know, worrying, oh, if you're, you know, if you lie now, you're going to always be a liar. And how are you ever going to, you know, have a spouse or hold a job if you- Well, this was my next question. This was Uh my next question. How do you deal with it? If you, if you catch them at telling you a lie, right? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with it? Yeah. How do you still keep the relationship and connection? Because it might Mm -hmm. have been a little white lie. Like, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, we stayed at Johnny's all night when they didn't. Mm -hmm. They actually went out to the park or did, I don't know, went Mm -hmm. out on their bikes in a mm-hmm. car. I don't know. Yeah. And then you find yeah. out about it because somebody's seen them and they go, oh, we saw it such and such at, you know, 
the park mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and you go, oh, he was supposed to be at Johnny's. Mm-hmm. And so like, how do you deal with the catching of the lie, right? Because it is like, it, like mm-hmm. I don't care what anyone says, whether you're, whether it's your parents lying to you, whether it's you lying to your parents, whether it's in a relationship mm-hmm. where you find out your partner's lying to you or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's never a nice feeling to find that you've been lied to. Yeah, no, of course not. So you know, you and I think, it? well, I think to your point, you know, you, you have to check your circumstance, right? Do you have a child who's normally truthful? <laughs> and this is like a one-time thing, you know, or is this a chronic problem? And, you know, I think whether it's the former or the latter, I would just suggest that, you know, you you want to approach them where they feel like it will benefit them to be honest and tell you the truth, then lie. Yeah. Right. So you can start with a, you know, sharing, having a conversation around like sharing your value of honesty. Like, hey, I just want you to know, like, it will always be better for you if you are honest and truthful with me. Like, I want honesty in our relationship. That's important to me. It's a big value of mine. And, you know, it will always be better for you if you are honest and truthful. And then the challenge is for you as a parent to actually execute on that. Yes. Right. You have, right. We have to motivate. If you want to motivate them to tell you the truth, they have to feel safe to tell you the truth that you're not going to be disappointed in them because they don't want to feel ashamed. You're not going to be mad at them. You're not going to punish them that you're really going to seek to understand you're going to seek to listen, that you're going to communicate like, hey, whatever is going on that you're feeling, like obviously they're doing something that part of them knows is wrong. That's why they're lying or not telling you. So by approaching them like, hey, whatever you're doing like or have done, it's always you and me against the problem. Like come to me and we can solve this together and I will try my best to stay calm to not get angry and just really to try to understand what's going on, that you're feeling this need to lie and what Mm. the behavior was you were doing that you're lying about. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. Well, and and what about, what about, so that's, I suppose that's the occasional lie, right? But what about if you're finding your child is consistently lying, if there's changes like, at what point do you start to get concerned and start to delve in a little bit deeper into your teen um, mm-hmm. regarding their attitude? Where where does it start to really concern you, right? And you go, well, hang on a minute. Mm-hmm. Think there is more going on here. I'm thinking when they're lying continuously, I don't know if there's mm-hmm. like, I don't know if there would be when they're just out all night, whatever. I mean, this would be my worst scenario, right? My worst scenario would be my son <laughs> lying to me all the time, him out all night, not listening to me, like not coming home, mm-hmm. not telling me where he is, like not knowing where he is, like all of those sort of things. Yeah, no, um, it's scary. Yeah, it's like scary. You know, that would be Terrible. my worst situation. But like, yeah, mm-hmm. like when do you yeah. start to... Is there any way that you can actually start to deal with that? That that's my worst situation. So, is there at any point I could have pulled it back in? How do I pull that back in? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm really I testing mean, think, you now. Yeah, no, no, not a problem. I mean, I so relate to this. I one of my three children that I, I was in that exact situation where it was oh, just wow. chronic lying, not taking responsibility, blaming others. Um, you know, and then when you'd ask about the lie, they lie about the lie, right? So, you know, the way, the way I, well, first of all, it's just to recognize that when you have chronic lying going on, this is a pattern that has been created and existed over a length of time. And so unfortunately there is no quick fix, (laughs) Right. This is something for the way I like to always think about it is as long as, as, as long as they had 
to get to the point where they are, say they've been lying for three years, I'm going to give it three years to undo it. Wow. Right? So you're really patient and you're recognizing like, okay, my teen had a part of this and so did I. Mm -hmm. Because somehow I, I unintentionally created an environment where they're too scared to tell me the truth. Yeah. They don't feel like I'm approachable, right? They don't feel like I understand them or get them. Yeah. And that's where I was with my kid. And this is the thing, right? So you can have three or four kids, but one kid is just like, feels as though you don't get them and that's it. They go off the rails. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're all so unique and different yeah. in their way. So, you know, the way you parent one child might work and it might not work for the next one. Yeah. So you're left like at the oh drawing God. board of, okay, I need a new, I need a different approach. With I this need a one. new plan. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. do you, once you've discovered the lie, the continual lies, do you start to put boundaries and restrict them? more? Mm -hmm. You know, I am not a huge advocate of punishment. Um, I am an advocate of boundaries, but honestly, before you even have any sort of conversation with them around boundaries or consequences, you got to back yourself way up and realize you first have to create a safe environment where they're motivated to tell you the truth. But how like do you do if that? If you keep trying to set boundaries or consequences, it's like I was saying before, you're addressing the surface level behavior and not the root cause yeah. of what's going on underneath it. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's approach where I was saying, like, you start with sharing your values, you know, outside of the moment, outside of the life, when it's calm, you right. know, you say, Hey, we got a prop, you know, listen, I, I don't like what's going on here. I, and I take my part and my responsibility in this. Somehow I created a situation where you don't feel comfortable being honest and truthful with me. And I want to change that. You just like own your part in it and you state what you want. And then you explain why it's so important to you. Like we skip this step all the time. Share why it's important to you. Listen, honey, it's so important to me that you're honest and truthful with me because that's just like a core value of mine. I want to have a relationship with you based on honesty and trust and transparency, Right. And, and I understand that's hard for you to do. If you think I'm going to punish you or be mad at you or disappointed in you. So I'm going to really work on staying calm and, and managing my own emotions. Right. And I want you to know that it will always be better for you to come to me with the truth right, than, than to lie that I will be much more mad and angry at the lie than I ever would be at what your actual behavior was. So you have to, that's what I was talking about earlier. You have to correct that thought error in them. Yeah. And then you got to follow through and show up with that intention, right? An intention of, listen, you know, owning and taking responsibility for your part of, and again, like uh, none of us set out <laughs> to to be angry at our teen and, and no. disappointed. Like it happens unintentionally. And so it's to slow ourselves down so we can like be less emotionally reactive and instead respond more with intention with like our calm, wise mind. <laughs> And then do you just keep reiterating and reiterating that this is what you want is, you know, to have a truthful and honest conversation with like every time you can imagine, like every yes. time they sort of like, they don't come or that, you know, if one of your rules of the house rules are, you let me know where you're going to and what time you're going to be home. Mm-hmm. Call it, call it mm-hmm. that. Right. And mm-hmm. then if they yeah. don't, or they don't get home or they go, mm-hmm. they're not, they're not at somebody else's house or whatever, or, you know, then, um, but then how do you, 
how do you deal with that lie then? Do you, if they say, oh, I'm going to be home at 10 and they don't get home till two, right? How do you deal mm-hmm. with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. So yeah, you, there's kind of two separate things going on. There's what we already talked about, yeah. which is, you know, that, like you said, you got to do over and over and over again, because initially when you communicate to them why it will be better for them to tell you the truth than to lie, they're not going to believe you because no, there's oh, a okay. pattern no. that's telling them, right? Because history yeah. tells them differently. Yeah. So that piece, you're right. You have to keep revisiting that conversation and coming back to that conversation and staying true to your words. So that's a piece of it. The other one is like what you're asking, what I hear you asking is like, what do you do in the moment when they lie? Right. How do we yeah. handle that? So their curfew was 10 and they don't come in till two o'clock. So for that, I walk my clients through this five step process, which is kind of a new approach that I never knew that's super effective. And it starts with first taking the time to calm your own emotions, right? Okay. Because is fair enough. they're late <laughs> and, you know, you might be angry that they're disrespect, you know, that they're not yeah. meeting curfew. You're feeling disrespected because they're not listening and abiding to the rule. And then sometimes then usually worry kicks in, like, where are they? I'm scared about, right? So yeah, who are they with? What's like, going on? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. think about that. Like you get flooded with all of these really big, heavy emotions. And what most of us do is like, it feels so bad and we want to get rid of it. That we can't, we just can't even resist the urge to talk to them right then and there. You're four hours late. What were you doing? Why didn't you call me? Right. We just like go on the attack because all of these emotions are flooding our body and just naturally we want to get rid of them. And so that's what we do. So it's to slow the whole process down and, and just to be like, okay, yeah, of course I'm pissed off and angry right now. And now worried, like any parent would be in this situation, you know, I'm going to take some deep breaths. Right. And I, you know, I like teach my clients, I have a bunch of different methods to help calm your emotions and settle your emotions down. And then once you've done that, you find a good time to talk, which is not at two in the morning. No. <laughs> right. So like choose your time wisely of when to have a conversation. And then you approach them in a way that they feel invited into the conversation versus defensive. So how do you invite them into the conversation? Because I'm sure there's people yeah. sitting there going, okay, how do I do how that? How do I do that? Yeah. Okay. So just know that typically what we do is we start with why. And yeah. why questions put most people, oh, including on the myself, defensive. Yeah, on me the too. Yeah. So take why out of your vocabulary and replace it with what. Yeah. Okay. And you want to just state the facts. That's it. So that might sound something like, hey, I noticed you came home at two in the morning last night. What happened? That's it. That's better than why did you come home at two in the morning? Yeah. What were you thinking? I was so worried you broke the rules, right? That's a natural reaction, but that does not invite them into a conversation. That makes them defensive and shut down. And And I suppose with... Using what, what happened means they've got to give you some, some answer, haven't they? They can't go, oh, nothing. Well, I suppose they could go, oh, nothing, but. Yeah. Right. Well, then you can say, you know, curfews at 10, you seem to be having a really tough time sticking to that. What's going on? Happy days. Fantastic. Right? We're just, trying to get at the, yeah. again, that root cause of the problem, because they might say something like, well, mom, you know, nobody leaves at 10. And I yeah. felt like so, I was so embarrassed and I felt so stupid to like be the only one leaving at 10 and no one left till two. And right. So you hear that and you're like, oh, okay. So they're trying to fit in with their peers. They were worried about being embarrassed and humiliated, right? They felt pressure to stay. 
And then, and then you validate those feelings like, Hey, okay, that makes sense that you'd blow your curfew. If you were worried about being embarrassed in front of all of your friends, we're we're not condoning blowing off curfew. What we're saying is we understand the feelings that were going on for them. The feelings of pressure or avoiding humiliation or embarrassment. That's how we connect with them. That's what the conversation needs to be about. Because when we do that, they feel like we understand how they're feeling and we get it. Yeah. Yeah. So when we create that connection first, it settles our team down. So, and it opens up the conversation so that you can then say something like, okay, gosh, well, we had agreed curfew was 10. Doesn't seem like that's working for you. When would you like your curfew to be? Listen to what they have to say. I mean, maybe they say 11 and 11's fine with you. Yeah. Maybe they say midnight. And that's too late. And so you offer a compromise. Okay, honey, I'm more comfortable with 10. You're more comfortable with midnight. How about trying 11 o'clock? What do you think of that? Right. But the whole attitude and concept is that you're approaching the problem together as a team, yeah. right? It's you're on the same side. It's you and your child against the problem of curfew. And yeah. hey, let's work together to solve it where I'm not worried about you and you're not embarrassed in front of your friends. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. So you're sort of understanding their issue um, and not actually um, compounding the problem as such and um, working out a new boundary or a new set of house rules as such, um, Mm -hmm. that you both can be happy with. It's like a negotiation as such. It is. Yes. I call what I learned it. It was called walking the middle path, right? It's like, it's not love. I love that phrase walking the middle path, you know, where it's like, okay, this is a teenager. Teenagers are trying to exert their independence right? They're trying to solve their own problems, yeah. right? And, and, and so how can we meet them where they're at? How can we find a compromise and something that they can agree to and we can agree to? And we, maybe we both feel a little uncomfortable, but we're not both on opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so to come up with that compromise and The big thing with teenagers that we miss out on is that they will cooperate and do the right thing when we get their buy-in. When we just are like, hey, your curfew's 10, you better be home by then. If not, you're grounded. That's not getting their buy-in. Do you think- No, go on, carry on. I was going to say, asking them like, well, what curfew do you think is reasonable? Right? And then sharing- what you as the parent think is reasonable, right? And coming up with a compromise, you've got their buy-in because they feel like they're part of the decision. And it's not you just being a policeman and making them do something, right? Or telling them this is the way it has to be. Yeah, That's when we end up having issues and and get the resistance from them. And what are your thoughts on grounding teenagers, right? Because- like I've been grand. I was grounded as a teenager. I was supposed to, I had a curfew. I was supposed to not go to a club. I went to a club. I mm-hmm. was supposed to be home by midnight. I didn't get home till like, I, there were issues around why I didn't get home. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but, mm-hmm. um, but nothing dodgy, just the person who was taking me home, lost the car keys. Right. That was it. And so I couldn't get home at midnight. Right. And so uh-huh. I phoned my parents being the good teen that I was, I phoned my parents and said, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not going to get back by midnight because this is the situation. I will get back as soon as I can. <laughs> I'll get a cab or whatever. I don't know. Right. But yeah. I phoned them to tell them. Admittedly, uh-huh. they'd said to me, if you don't get back by midnight, we're locking the doors and you have nowhere to sleep. Right. So I was like, ah, 
okay, manipulation to a certain extent. But look, at the end uh-huh. of the day, I it, I phoned them and said, hey, I'm not getting back by midnight, so please don't lock the doors, which they were never going to do anyway. And um, and I got back at like half past one in the morning or whatever, and they did the, right, you're grounded, that's it, grounded for two months, mm-hmm. which really pissed me off. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure it stopped me from doing anything, though. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, what are your thoughts on grounding? I'm like, eh. I mean, grounding to me is a form of punishing. Yeah. And, you know, my philosophy and my process, what I have found with my clients is that if you follow this process, a lot of which I've shared here with you today, you don't ever need to get to the point of punishing because you've been able to set boundaries that you feel good about that they've agreed to. And you've, you've created a situation where you can communicate about whatever problem may arise. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like you you really have to start with the connection piece. Yeah. And when you start with the connection piece, the cooperation falls into place. Yeah. And so to be honest, all my clients who used to punish, they don't punish anymore because wow. they don't need to get there, right? With this with this new communication approach, um, there never just there never becomes a problem or that arises that you do have to punish for. You've got communication tools in place, you know, that provide boundaries based on your values. And, you know, your teen is motivated to cooperate because they feel like you respect them and you, you know, want to hear what's going on with them and you understand them. Um, and that you listen, right. You mentioned that earlier, like the, it's like one of the big yeah. things with teenagers is, you know, talk less, smile more, <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, tell me more. You yeah. Know? Like, well, this oh, is the oh, thing. And what else? If you're quiet, people tend to feel as though they need to fill the space, right. Fill that quiet space. Um, and I, it's the same with the teen, right, at the end of the day. So it's about listening to what they have to say. Uh, and then they might keep going and who knows what you might hear. And then you've got to not react, process it, <laughs> and deal with those emotions. Yes. yes no, yeah, no, that's well, fair I'm enough. So that's glad fair you enough. brought that point up too because I think naturally when – our teens tell us something, we feel like we have to respond right then yeah. and there, you know, and who made that rule up? <laughs> that rule no. usually gets us into trouble. So to your point, it's like, okay, I don't need to respond right now. I can even say to my team, you know, something like, you know what? I really want to think about that. Can I get back to you? You know, you, you don't That's have to enough. try to solve it all in the, a moment when emotions are heated. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, how do people get in contact with you if they want to find out more about you and, um, yeah, what, what you do as such? Yeah. (laughs) I love it. Thanks for asking. Um, probably if you're interested in like the approach I've been talking about today, the best way to get more information on that is to join my Facebook group, which is called parenting teens, how to not lose your shit. (laughs) Um, (laughs) right. Cause we know we all want to be calm and not yell. Oh yeah. Um, so that's probably like the best place with the most resources and where I do Facebook lives and we get into like deep dive discussions about how to stay calm, how to stop your teen from lying, how to get them to take responsibility. How about the morning routine? How to make the morning routine smooth? You know, we were talking right. How do you get them to tidy their bedroom? How do you get them yes. to tidy their bedroom? Put the washing in the wash basket and not on the floor. All of those things. Yeah. So that's a really fun place with tons of resources. And then I do offer a couple free classes if you want to, you know, for your listeners, I can give cool. you the link to those. Yeah, that would um, be great. And then I send me that Instagram. link through. I'll okay. put it in the blurb and we'll we'll go from there. No, that's great. That's awesome. Well, look, I have one final question for you, which might be quite yeah. poignant with the what the subject we've been talking about. What is a piece of advice that you've been given that you still use today? Mm. 
Oh gosh, so many good ones. I know. I think the first one that comes to mind is a bit of what we talked about today, which is just resisting that urge to talk when you're feeling like emotionally charged with anger or yeah. fear or yeah. worry. And just like give yourself some breathing room. Just take the time to pause and do some, you know, deep breaths or go for a walk outside, you know, something to take the time to calm your own fears and worries down because we're parents and we naturally worry about them and want the best for them. And so just to resist that urge to talk right in the moment when you're feeling really emotionally charged. And as a parent as well, you need to be confident that what you've taught them as a kid, as a baby, as a child, um, is a good foundation for them. And they and they have to, they've got to make their mistakes, right? We've all made our mistakes. It doesn't matter whether our parents had made the same mistakes, right? We all have to go out there and do exactly the same mistake as they did because, like, well, even now, even now, and I'm 50-odd, right? Like I sit there and I go talk to my mum about something she goes oh you know you need to do x y and z and I go yeah well um thanks mum I'll sort it out myself I'm a 50 it will be fine but like doesn't feel good no and and she's nine times at 10 right anyway so that's Mm -hmm. annoying but you know that's okay I have to (laughs) I have to make one and you know and the thing is I sometimes I'll be saying to her no I don't want to know about that because I know she's right I know she's right, but I don't want to hear it because as a child, you don't want to hear what your parents are right. You don't want to tell them that they're right. But um, yeah, yeah. you're trying to figure it out yourself. Yeah. And you as a parent. recognize like, yeah, it's, it's natural for them to make mistakes. Like their lens of life and their decision making, of course, it's not the same as yours. You're 50 something. And they're teens and they're trying to figure it out. And, you know, we so, um, we expect when they're learning to walk that they're going to fall down. Yeah. But then for some reason, our brain, primitive brain takes over and we think, oh my God, if, if they make a mistake or there's a problem, like I've got to fix it. Yeah. You know, I got to correct it versus like, okay, this is just normal. Like yeah. They're they're learning, they're yeah, figuring right. it out in the safety of our home. Yeah. We want them to do that. So well, and they come have to the us life if they need skills help. to launch. Absolutely. And if they, you know, we're, we're there to support them really. Um, and um, pick up the pieces when they make the mistake and then, you know, they need our help for something as yeah. such or education, um, advice, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, look, thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. It's it's been interesting talking about these teens. I hopefully have got I a few years I bet with an off. eight-year-old. I know. And he's <laughs> close to you. the teenage <gasps> years and he's already giving me the look and going, mom, yeah. what you said is just insane. Um, so <laughs> that's okay. That's co- Or oh. mom, stop dancing. Or mom, stop singing. Or mom, you're embarrassing me. Stop it. So there's lots of stop it at the moment, but that's okay. That's mm-hmm. I said to him, when you become a parent, you can do this to your kids. <laughs> so it's all good it's all oh, good well, but Claire, like, thank you for having me especially with you just having an eight-year-old it's so sweet of you to have me on to be talking about some different approaches for when they hit the teen years so thank oh, you grateful no, to you no thank you thank you it's been a pleasure a real pleasure thanks for listening if you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast or for links, resources and show notes go to our website, www.strongsingleandhuman.com. 
We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast.